Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the great pleasure to talk to you about one of the classics in ecology, which is ecological succession. Now, as the name implies, succession means that there's going to be a replacement, a transition, and ecological means that there's going to be a transition in community over time. And as we're going to see that there's some really cool examples of ecological succession, there's really two types as well, primary and secondary succession. And so let's just jump right into this conversation. It truly is one of the great classics in the study of ecology. It's sort of a, it, it's a transition between the study of community ecology and ecosystem ecology, because it involves both competition between organisms and it also in, uh, is a discussion of nutrient quality in the soil, which is sort of abiotic. And so this first picture here is uh, that you can see is this gentleman is, of course, John Muir, the great naturalist. And here he is sitting on this very famous rock. Uh, and this is Mirror Lake, Mirror because it's reflective in Yosemite National Park in California, where he spent a lot of time hiking and, and writing about beautiful Yosemite National Park. And I'm going to bring up an example of how Mirror Lake is also undergoing ecological succession. So that's why I wanted to start with this picture. <clears throat> so it's a transition in species comp composition over time. And so let's just get right into that. So as I mentioned, there's something called primary, which means first and secondary is second. Primary means that there's a place where there's no soil at all. And there's a gradual transition from that rock into maybe a complex community, like say a forest. And so it's pretty hard to imagine where there are places still on earth where there's rock and there's no soil, but we'll talk about that. And then secondary succession is where there's already existing soil. Maybe there is a, um, a forest and there was some sort of disturbance, a uh, fire that, that, that burned down that vegetation and then uh, the next series of communities come in and replace it. And so there's primary and secondary succession. So let's take a look at this. So I was mentioning Yosemite National Park. Just I want to begin with a discussion of that. Before Yosemite Valley looks as it does today, as we're familiar with it, it was once just sort of your typical V-shaped uh, canyon that was being carved out by the Merced River. And as you can see, you can't really see any of the sort of traditional mountain landscape right here. Like here's Half Dome, and it doesn't really even look so much like a Half Dome. Here's, this is what I mean. This is the Merced River, and here's this classic V-shaped valley that's car carved by the river. Now, we believe that Glacier, which is a big ice river, which is capable of movement, uh, although ever so slowly, so it doesn't, you know, it's, so I'm almost imperceptible, but it's capable of moving and ice can be rather strong and it's extremely heavy. It can actually sort of rub against the rocks and actually erode and carve them. And so we believe glaciers entered into Yosemite Valley a long time ago and maybe several millions of years ago and the glacier pretty much filled up the whole valley. And as a result, it sort of carved out the terrain as we're, as we're familiar with today. And so when that glacier started to melt or recede underneath the glacier, this is what I was getting at with this uh, rock, no soil. It's hard to imagine that any life, and I know life is pretty strong, like, like prokaryotic life and ex especially those archaea that can live under those extreme conditions, but maybe there was no life at all underneath a glacier because of that tremendous pressure and weight and cold. And so what when it recedes, you have this bare rock, but it's not going to stay bare rock. It's going to eventually transition itself into more and more species diversity and ultimately more vegetation will come into the area and then more animals will come into the area. And so this is what we mean by primary succession a transition from bare rock to say a forest. So back to the Yosemite Valley. When the, when the glacier re was receding, a lot of that glacier, uh, of course, melted into water. Now, 
of course the water would just run down the Merced River, but what's interesting is we believe that when the glacier was moving along, this big sort of frozen river, do you know how sediments can occur in, in moving water? Well, the glacier is capable of carrying giant rocks inside of it, sort of like, like sediments in a river. And so when the glacier was melting, it literally like dropped all of that sediment and rocks over here at the mouth of Yosemite. And so therefore it formed sort of a dam right here and it formed what we believe was Yosemite Lake long ago. And so since, since then, this accumulation of debris, which is called a glacier moraine, a glacier moraine, uh, it broke down and then the, the lake sort of came, came out. And so here's a picture, not a, literally of the Yosemite glacier, but a glacier. And here it is receding and here's the water in front of it. And so now we have the present day Yosemite Valley, which you can see is U-shaped like this, which is characteristic of the fact that a glacier came through and carved out that there's El Capitan and there's Half Dome. And so this is a picture of Half Dome that was partially carved by the glacier that was receding up into this canyon. And this is a picture from a very famous vista called Glacier Point. And it's called Glacier Point because we believe that the glacier literally came up to that height. And so this is an extremely famous picture. This was our naturalist, John Muir, and this is the president of the United States, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And so there are letters between the two of them and, and John Muir always wanted uh, Teddy Roosevelt to come to see Yosemite, uh, to see the great Yosemite Valley and also to enjoy the, the uh, sequoia trees. And so there they are, 1906. There's Yosemite Falls behind it. It's a, it's a classic. So I was mentioning the, this glacier Moran, which is a, an accumulation of sediments that the, that the glacier literally dropped. And if you go through Yosemite Valley, you could actually see these mountains with these boulders. And that's what, what happened when the glacier dropped. And so what I want to talk about is once the glacier recedes, it doesn't have to be Yosemite, but once a glacier recedes, you have this bare rock. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what, what I mean by primary succession, primary meaning number one. So it starts off with bare rock, but it's not going to remain bare rock forever. This is going in this direction. This is representing time. And when I say time, this is not five minutes or it's not even a couple of days or a couple of months. This is what we're talking about our years here. Of course, it takes perhaps hundreds of years in order to accumulate into a forest or transition into a forest. And this is what we mean by succession, transition, community replacement and transition over time. But do you notice something without, without me going into detail? Do you notice like over here, if I were to ask you the question, why is it this way? Why, how come the tree doesn't just simply grow right over here? That's a, that's a, that's a fair question. Like why doesn't the tree grow uh, after five years. Why does the trees have to wait a hundred years to grow? And it's not so much that it takes a hundred years for them to grow, but rather it might have something to do with the abiotic conditions of the soil. And if you guessed that, you guessed it correctly. So uh, primary succession is newly exposed rock, and it could even be lava. And, when I, and it's like lava. Well, Rock is formed from melted lava, like in other words, a, an oceanic island, like on the bottom of the ocean, um, lava could be spewing out and it accumulates and then an, an island emerges in the ocean and then that's bare rock. That would be another e example of primary succession. And so ultimately, here's a picture of that. So islands like the Hawaiian Islands or the Galapagos Islands, Although those archipelagos are really the tops of volcanoes, that the lava is coming out and it's, and it's cooling and forming rock. And at that point, there's no life at all. This is just completely barren. And so you're like, well, is it going to remain this way? And of course not. It's going to transition into something um, over a long period of time. And so when you start off with bare rock, there are nutrients, of course, present, but I wouldn't say that it's quality soil <laughs> because 
one of the things is if you were to try to dr grow a tree onto this, the roots would never be able to penetrate the rock. And so what we've got to t talk about is how rocks break down into soil. And so rock breaking down into soil involves uh, two, two phenomena. There's a physical uh, component to that, which means that there's the, the pressure, the weathering, the water that fits into the crevices and cracking it when it expands and gets cold. There's, so there's physical wear, wearing down of the rock, and then there's the biological, which means that small organisms, microscopic organisms like bacteria first, but then of course lichen would might be coming second, but those organisms live and die, live and die, and that, that organic, meaning carbon-containing compounds, start to accumulate, and that starts the beginning of making soil uh, and of course, it's not great soil in the beginning. And so here, I like this. This is a great uh, example of I'll sort of illustrate this. It's hard to see it. So number one would be right after the glacier recedes. And then as you can see here, there's rock and, and not much soil. And so at first, there's no plants, there's no animals, no insects, no seeds, no soil. So there's hardly anything right here. And then the rocks start to break down. And perhaps you could start to see that number three, you could start to see that there might be an accumulation of some soil. So maybe at this point, there's some soil building up in here, the rocks breaking down. There might be some bacteria, and there might be some lichen, maybe even some moss growing. And that might make it more and more favorable for some primitive plants to be coming into the area. And so over here, you start to see, well, if the soil quality starts improving, then you might even get some, some grasses to grow and then maybe even some shrubs might come into the area. And, and then again, that provides carbohydrate, that's primary productivity, which was going to facilitate the arrival of herbivores. So then herbivores come into the area. Herbivores are not gonna come into the area if there's no plants. So the herbivore comes in, so hello comes the animals. And then, you know, they start pooping and they start increasing the soil quality they start dying in the area and so they now we have a community happening and so the neighborhood's sort of improving and then next thing you know you're starting to get small trees and shrubs and then ultimately after hundreds and hundreds of years a forest maybe a coniferous forest and we like to call this the climax community climax community and it's sort of the end if you will theoretical end to ecological succession as the climax community. So soil will develop, but it'll develop gradually. Here's one of those volcanic islands. And it's the result, as I mentioned before, of rock weathering and organic matter accumulating. And that's how soil. Now, this is not a discussion of soil development, but if you wanted to consider that, you can get into it. But I'll just say this, that on, a, on bare rock, what will happen is you know, it's it, again, there's nutrient in here. And if it's moist enough, perhaps there's like maybe a hint of algae might be able to grow along the side. And then if you throw in maybe like a bird dropping over here, which will provide some nitrogen for it. And then perhaps over time, it'll might be conducive for lichen. Now, why do I keep mentioning lichen? Lichen's a tough organism. You may know this already, but lichen is actually two different species combined into one. It's a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and algae. So together they're very strong because algae is capable of photosynthesizing, but it's not very good without enough water. And so the fungus has a primitive root system and they use its hyphae in order to accumulate all the possible moisture that even on a rock. And so together, they can live. And so photosynthesis and fungi are is what lichen is. And so lichen can grow almost on bare rock, and it does grow on bare rock. So there's not lots of different species of lichen. That's what all these different colors are. So they're extremely hardy. They don't re require really rich soil. But what, what's happening is they're they're surviving, but then they die, and then they come, then it, they grow, and then they die, and they grow, and they die. And then so overall, they're bettering the neighborhood. So the rock is being broken down because some of these lichens can secrete acids which start to erode the rock and turn it into soil.
Now, how's this for a kicker? And this is one of the, the key events in ecological succession. So what thanks does the lichen get for living on the rock and for all of these years breaking the, the rock down into soil, living and dying, living and dying? And you know what it does? It actually creates a little bit better conditions. It actually improves the abiotic conditions. So a little bit of soil, so much so that now a new species, say, of moss comes. Now the moss maybe was present all along, but it couldn't live just on the rock. It needed the neighborhood to be a little bit better. So how do you like this? Now that the, the lichen like, created a, a better environment, the moss comes along and it outcompetes. So competition is a real important thing. When I talk about a replacement of transition of community, we're talking about they don't go easily. So the lichen is outcompeted by the moss. Why is that? I mean, the moss is a little bit better at photosynthesis. So it's able to grow a little bit more robust. Still again though, it, it doesn't have a vascular system. So it's, it's incumbent upon living on top of the rock or on, or on the side of a tree, whatever, but it's not gonna grow tall. But it's, but it's more um, competitive than that is of lichen. And so the way I would describe this somewhat, may, maybe poetically perhaps, is that the lichen sowed, not literally, because they don't have seeds, but they sow the seeds of their own destruction. So how do you like that? By bettering the neighborhood, by increasing the soil quality, increasing the abiotic nature of the soil, those early arriving organisms facilitate, in other words, help. They facilitate the appearance of later species by making the soil more favorable. And what thanks do they get? So how do you like this? So when the moss lives and dies, lives and dies, lives and dies, then you actually start accumulating some soil and then maybe some weeds come into the area, some simple grasses. Now grass, now that's a pretty advanced plant. Now that has a vascular system that's going to grow a little bit taller. That's going to maybe even have a little branching and some shrubs. That's going to outcompete moss every single time. So eventually the grass will dominate over the moss and eliminate the moss. How do you like that? So that means that with the grass actually pave the way for their own demise because now the shrubs are coming in. So the shrub again is even more, um, can articulate even more through its branching. It can be even a deeper root system, more water, larger uh, leaves, all of this, just better in general. And so what you have here is a transition from what was once rock to lichen, to moss, to simple grasses and weeds, to shrubs. And then eventually, how do you like this? So this is a long period of time. Now the soil quality, let's go back to that. The soil quality is getting better and better and better. Now, why is that? Well, again, it's the organisms living and dying, which is in decomposition, which is increasing, increasing, like, let's just call it out. The nitrogen in the soil, the phosphorus in the soil is increasing. So that facilitates when there are shrubs, shrubs kind of have Sometimes they're even fruiting, like for you get some manzanita or whatever. Now that's going to attract birds into the area. That might attract even some rodents and things like that. Some worms are in here. So now you get a whole like little community happening and the ecosystem's improving. More species diversity. How about that? And then there's even more vegetation. So that's going to attract even more animals to the area. So the area is kind of booming, if you will. It's a real thriving neighborhood. And now the soil is so, this is like, like literally decades, perhaps even more than a hundred years. Now the soil is, is finally conducive for some trees to start to grow. And then ultimately some soft trees and then some hard trees. And what's interesting here is when you look over at the, at the climax community, the climax community may not necessarily be the most species diverse. I just want you to think about this for a second. And I say that because the fact that sometimes in a forest, the canopy can block out a lot of sunlight and reduce some, some herbs from being able to grow. And I might add that a lot of the biomass and some of these bigger hardwood trees are in the trunk themselves. 
and the foliage is up here carrying a lot of the primary productivity. So there's a lot of carbon here, but it's not accessible to deer and what have you and rabbits and these sort of things. So interestingly enough, and this is something that we'll be talking about in a moment, this sort of in-between area has the greatest biodiversity right in here. And so you're like, well, how's it ever going to go back? It always seems to go in one direction. Let me just foreshadow this for, for a second. How succession can go in a backward direction is, watch this, fire, uh, lightning strike. <laughs> and so how do you like that? The forest burns down and it goes back over to this. And so then you're going to have, and this is called secondary succession. When you start off with already soil present, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself but to bring it up. Because what's interesting is that a disturbance like fire, and this is important, an intermediate disturbance like fire can actually increase species diversity because it's sort of setting back ecological succession and increasing primary productivity, and therefore more species can thrive. How do you like that? So that's pretty cool. So getting back to just sort of the, the nitty gritty about how this works. And so here's rock and there's some lichen. There's some, this is, this kind of has it all going here. <laughs> there's some lichen. This is some moss over here. Uh, this is some leaf litter. In other words, some pine needles or whatever. So, and so when this, when this uh, decomposes, this might eventually accumulate into something like that resembles soil. And so as it turns out, what's happening is what you have going here is sort of bacteria are always first to arrive in lichen and moss. And so these guys are pretty tough going. And so what we call this group of organisms that arrive first, the, the first ones to colonize and develop the soil, we call them the pioneer species. Now, you know, these terms are you know, relatively important, but it's important in a sense that if you're describing succession, if you're sort of writing an essay, or you're trying to discuss this, it's always helpful to bring up some terms because it really speaks more accurately and more profoundly about what you're trying to, to mention. And so these early arrivals are called pioneer species. And what, what do they all have in common? Well, pioneer means that they're sort of tough, they're autotrophic organisms, so they're not consumers. So in other words, the, the first to arrive after the glacier is not a deer. <laughs> okay, so you gotta have photosynthesis. So they're autotrophic. And again, they're very tough going. And so what they what the pioneers do is that they colonize and they actually improve, and let me em emphasize this by circling it, they improve the abiotic environment. And so what that does is that it prepares the ground for the arrival of grasses and then ultimately shrubs and then ultimately trees. And so check this out. This is important because this discusses the uh, a look at the soil quality. And so look over here over on the y-axis. You see how this is the topsoil nitrogen, which is a key element in uh, the soil that, that uh, plants need. So look at this. It's taken like a hundred years for the soil to develop in nitrogen. You see that? It's slowly increasing and increasing and increasing. So if you went over here and you're taking soil samples and you're like, geez, how much nitrogen is in the soil? This is your question. How much nitrogen is in the soil? The answer would be not so much. And then if you came over here and you're like, well, now I'm going to take a look at how much nitrogen in the soil. And you're like, wow, there's a lot in the soil now. How did it happen? Well, again, a lot of living and dying, living and dying, and then bacteria are also helping to increase the nitrogen in there. But watch this. Why does it dip off a little bit as you're, as you're transitioning into this uh, spruce forest over here? Why does it dip down a little bit? Because the truth is some of the nitrogen is now locked into these trees. And so it's in the living forest. It's not just in the soil. So it's a little bit of a dip right in here. So I find that that's interesting. So the point being that the soil nutrient quality increases over time. And so let's, let's look at a, a real life example of this. And so where can we find glaciers? The, the glacier that formed Yosemite Valley is no longer, 
but we could still go up to Glacier Bay in Alaska and check it out. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You said that primary succession takes hundreds of years. How am I going to go up to Glacier Bay? I'm going to get a ticket on a cruise ship and I'm going to go up to Glacier Bay, Alaska and see ecological succession in two weeks. Yes, <laughs> you are going to see it. And so what's, you know, wait, wait a minute. Well, check this out. When you go up there now, of course, maybe your, your, your cruise ship is over here. Okay. Here's your cruise ship and it's parked over here. Now you can take a little bit of a boat and come onto the land. So this is you coming onto the land. Now check this out. If you were to go BD, BD, BD all the way through here and come all the way back, you'll actually be able to see the glacier. There it is. There's the real glacier. And so it's like frozen pun intended frozen in time. You're looking at ecological succession. Now notice the scale here is in kilometers so 15 kilometers. So this is pretty far away. So check this out. This area right here where the glacier is still present, it's still receding back. What do you think the soil quality is right after the glacier receded? And if you're if you're thinking poor, you're correct. And so you could literally see the type of vegetation, these pioneer organisms that are capable of growing right over here. So that's actually what's happening. So, but check this out, the glacier once upon a time, let me sort of illustrate this once upon a time, I'll go yellow, wasn't right there. It was actually right over here. And then way back in time, it was like right over here. So are you following this? That means that, for example, if you go further up this way, you'll be able to see a different stage. You'll be able to see grasses. You'll be able to see some shrubs growing in the area. And again, if you were to test the, here's somebody right here testing the soil quality and the nitrogen would be increasing. And then look at this further away from the glacier, you actually start to see uh, the beginnings of a forest occurring. And again, the soil quality increasing. And then finally, way over here um, in Glacier Bay, you start to see more of a climax community. Isn't that incredible? So you can actually see ecological succession, even though it takes a long amount of time. And then again, these are actual numbers in those particular areas. Let me go back for a second. So this is low nitrogen, a little bit more a little bit more and then the most of all is in the spruce area and these are actual numbers showing how the abiotic factors increase so let's bring it back to yosemite so how about this there's there's still a lake in yosemite valley but it's not the the result of the glacier melting it's a beautiful lake called mirror lake and i think you might know why it's called mirror lake by this photograph it's very famous i, I started the the video with john muir sitting on a rock at, at Mirror Lake. It's very popular because it's only about a, a mile hike to get to it. And so many people like to enjoy it and swim there in the summer. It's very popular. So what's the story with it? Well, as it turns out, the reason that it's there is that this little creek right here um, was formed when Tanaya, this is Tanaya Creek, uh, was cruising along, cruising along, and then there was a big rock slide from the top of Half Dome. Let me go back here for a second. Half Dome's right up here. So some rocks came down and they formed a dam, which actually blocked off the creek and it formed a lake. And so, as you may know, creeks carry sediments, like these small grains of, of sand and uh, what have you. And so, as it turns out, when the creek is moving along really quickly, the sediments remain suspended in the water. But then when it reaches, when the speed slows down as it enters into Mirror Lake, the sediments sort of fall down because it's such a, a, a larger area. And so it slows down. And so what has been happening over decades and decades is that the sediment has been increasing and increasing. And it gets so much that late in the summer, the mirror lake would actually fill up and it would be very sandy. And so guests to Yosemite, as the story goes, we're, we're, we're getting pretty upset. They're like, you know, we used to, I used to swim here as a child and now my kids can't swim here. It's like all this, it's, it's shrinking. You know, I, I wish the park service can do something about this. You know, it's probably because 
the park service is running out of money. I don't know. So the park service was like, gee, the, the guests are getting upset. So in the wintertime, they'd actually, believe it or not, they'd literally go out there under this kind of pressure with bulldozers and they take the big shovels and they'd like scrape out all the sediment. And so that when the rains would come, it would fill back up and people would have their mirror lake. Yay. But then it turns out that um, the park service started thinking, you know, that's kind of unnatural that we're going in there and altering the environment. I think we just let it go and just let it happen the way it is. And so as it turns out, it's getting more and more shallow. And so this is what we're talking about. There's a succession. And so here's a profile of Mirror Lake. And then over time, do you see how the sediments are building up, building up, building up? And so it's getting more and more shallow. And the point of this is, as the, you know, in the lake, the sediments, this is like soil down here. And so the, the lake has next to it, like vegetation and those leaves and such and debris gets into the water and it settles to the bottom, not to mention the different, like little bugs and things and small fish are dying. And so as it turns out, all of that decaying de detritus on the bottom accumulates and actually the soil is pretty good and it's going to be kind of marshy. And so how do you like this? So someday what was once mirror lake is going to become mirror meadow. I know, but this is what happens. It's ecological succession. And so first the grasses will grow because the soil maybe isn't that good. It's certainly better than like a bare rock. Okay. So there is soil. So this is, you could say this is secondary succession because we're starting off with soil. And so grasses will grow. And again, they're annual. They live and die, live and die. But eventually as the story goes, you'll get some shrubs and then some trees will come in and trees will eventually grow. And so there'll be a transition from what was mirror lake to now mirror meadow. And then maybe it'll, it'll be a forest. And then how about this? Maybe your kids will go visit Yosemite Valley someday and think, why is this called Mirror Lake? I don't even see a lake. All I see are shrubs in a tree. I don't get it. And you'll be able to explain it to them. So let's talk about secondary succession. Now I mentioned secondary succession begins, I sort of alluded to it earlier when I said there, a fire came down and wiped out the, the forest. Well, here's another example of a disturbance right over here. This is a mountain in the state of uh, Washington called Mount St. Helens. And I think it was around 1980, there was a huge eruption from this volcano and all this lava started coming down. And, it, and it, now this is a major dis disturbance. Remember we talked about minor and intermediate and major. This is major. It's not maybe so good, but this is what happens. That a volcano came and it just completely obliterated the forests that were around there. It was brutal. And so as it turns out, you know, succession is going to rebound. And so you're going to be able to see these communities come back because what happens in the end is that following, say something, and I can give more examples than, other than a, than a volcano, but following a fire, following a flood, following a storm, or even if it's human activity, like say we came into an area and we logged it and then we left, it's going to grow back. Or if we had agriculture, say we were farming in here, we decided to abandon it, it's going to come back. And so fire is a significant disturbance. And as it turns out that those nutrients then go into the soil like this. So when the fire comes, the nutrients go back into the soil. And so it's secondary succession is a lot faster than primary succession. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's much, much faster because you don't have to develop soil. So as you can see in this diagram of secondary succession, you get a fire and it actually increases the nutrient quality. And so in just in a few years, you'll get the forest to come back in place. Now, not, not just one or two years, but in several years. What's fascinating is that, you know, people are capable of understanding this even, even uh, like many years ago. It's like... Uh, Native uh, people who lived in, in these wooded areas knew that if they could actually start their own fires, they would actually set back these smaller trees and actually keep getting more and more fertile soil. Because again, you want these grasses and things like this. You want these smaller herbs to grow, which encourages uh, herbivores to come into the area, which might be a good food source for the people.
and it might actually increase the ability to farm in an area as well. Isn't that fascinating that uh, though people maybe didn't understand nutrient quality of the soil, they had a sense of it in terms of the fact that fire would actually uh, be beneficial to a community. So let's talk about this. Like say, for example, let's bring it close to home, bring it home. <laughs> say this is your house, the lovely home. Say that this is your lawn. So do you notice this grass right here? It's, it's taken over the whole area and it doesn't have a lot of species diversity. I don't think you want it. I think you just want grass. So this is, you know, it's here. So what would, what would you say if all of a sudden ah, you decided to kill it with fire? And you, <laughs> that's very dramatic. You didn't see that coming. So you go out there and you're like blast it with fire and you burn your grass down. And so, ah, look what happens now. So what's interesting is why are, <laughs> see all these weeds and different shrubs and crab grass and dandelions and this is like chaos. And it's like, what, what, the, what's, what's happening? Why is this happening? Well, let's go back over here for a second. Do you notice here, this is just one species and it's like, how come weeds aren't growing here? How come the crab grass is not growing here? Well, it could, you know, and, and you know, the, you'd probably want to go out and remove it. But the thing is, it doesn't grow because it would have to compete with all of this lawn that's there. Do you follow this? So this is what I was trying to say about how when there's a forest, I know this is not a forest, but when there's a forest present, it's kind of dominating to a point where it's out competing a lot of other species. And so you, you have like less species diversity. But if a fire were to come and set it back to just soil, that increases the opportunity for new arrivals to come. To the area and this is the point that i'm attempting to make i can also go further with this like for example this is the problem that people have when they try to take their skin and they try to use a lot of, all these antibacterial soaps and they keep sterilizing themselves with with alcohol what it does is think of the bacteria that live on your skin as this lawn and if you keep obliterating it with the with this harsh soaps and alcohol uh perels What's going to happen is you're not going to have the, the, the normal flora that's there and then maybe some real troublesome germs will get onto your skin and, and actually cause an infection because, because of this phenomenon. So here's something. Say you lived in, the, in, this, in this house in the Midwest and say it was Kansas and you were a corn farmer and you won the lottery and you're like, okay, I'm leaving Kansas. I'm coming to San Francisco. So you you abandon your cornfield. Now, you don't want to sell the land because it's sort of sentimental, but you're just going to let it go. Now, say you come back to it 20, 30 years from now. Is it going to look exactly like that? Now, look in the distance. Do you see there's a little forest back there? So you have to imagine the soil is probably pretty good. And so what do you think is going to grow on it just in a couple of years? Some weeds are going to grow, right? And then perhaps, you know, the the dead corn is going to go into the soil and there's going to be lots of weeds. Probably the neighbors are going to be upset. They're jealous. And then what? Some shrubs and some trees. And so when, you know, I mentioned before in terms of a disturbance, like agriculture is a disturbance, but then when it's no longer, secondary succession will take place. So the weeds will come and then some smaller trees and then ultimately a mature hard forest will grow where your corn filled was. But then again, if I was mentioning this before, I'm going to emphasize it. If a fire were to come and set it back, ultimately it's this medium area, this intermediate area, which has the greatest uh, biodiversity and it almost, and it also has the greatest primary productivity because there's a lot more foliage here for herbivores to eat. And so therefore more trophic levels can thrive. So I hope you enjoyed that look at ecological succession. It, it's certainly a classic in the study of ecology. Thanks for watching.